I'm Justin Mott and welcome to my home here in Hanoi, Vietnam. And if you're new here, my channel is dedicated to all things photography from the perspective of a full-time working professional photographer. And today I'm going to ask you guys this question. You ever wonder what it's like to go on a professional photography assignment? Do you think you can handle it? Well, today I'm going to break down my most recent assignment for the New York Times travel section here in Vietnam. I'm going to go through from start to finish sort of how the assignment unfolds tell you the gear that I use, show you some pictures along the way, and stay tuned to the end so you can see what pictures they chose for the publication. So let's get into it and let's talk photography. So before we dive in, I just want to let you guys know I'm having a whopping sale on my online store for my one-on-one -on -one classes, specifically for my monthly mentorship program. This program is for anyone out there that really wants a polite big kick in the butt. Anyone that wants help finding their style and their photography through working on a personal project. The price is normally $1,500 a month. Some people do it one off. Some people do it month to month. Right now it's $500 off. It's only $999 a month. That includes four one-on-one -on -one sessions spaced out over the course of a month, one per week, and also gives you unlimited access to me via WhatsApp. I only offer five of these a month. Right now, I think I have two left, but check my website, justamont.com, for the latest on availability. I've also got presets on there and prints available and other classes available. Again, you can check all that out at justinmott.com. All right, so here's how it works. I'm gonna break it down step by step. So first, it starts with an email checking on my availability and then telling me sort of an idea, a rough idea what the story's about and then the location. So for this story, it was about cable cars or Vietnam's obsession with breaking cable car records in the Guinness Book of World Records. And the story was in Vietnam and it was scattered throughout all of Vietnam. The writer had already written the story, but they're not gonna send me the full story until I accept. It's like, until you choose to accept this mission, you don't get all the information. The reason they do that is just to ensure that like, I don't accidentally share the story with someone else and someone steals the story. At this point in my career, I'm lucky enough to be able to like choose stories that I'm interested in. And so that hasn't always been the case. There's a good portion of my career where I just accepted everything. But this story sounded interesting. It was in my backyard. I live here in Vietnam. So I thought, yeah, okay, I accept. From there, my editor gives me the full story or at least a rough draft of the story. Then I start to plan, start to formulate ideas, plan the logistics, plan my gear. Uh, I just make a little note here. Sometimes I'll be working directly with the writer if it's something like happening urgently in the news or if it's some sort of expedition and they've planned something or made arrangements for special access to something. You can either be working alone at the same time as a writer, you can be working with the writer direct, or it could be something like this case with a writer, and often this is the case with travel stories. The writer had written the story, submitted the story, and they found that it was worthy of a budget for photography, worthy of me, I guess. So once I accept, I start to plan. The editor might suggest a certain amount of days depending on the budget because they do pay you per day. And yes, before you ask, and this is a question people ask me the most, do they pay for your expenses? Yes, they pay for my expenses. I don't go on assignments and like lose money on flights and things like that. They pay for my flights, logistics, food, uh, lodging, uh, and a fixer or translator if I need one. But obviously everything's within reason. I'm not like going out there and staying at five-star luxury resort and eating luxurious meals and sh sipping champagne. Everything has to be done within reason. And so I started to plan. First, I start to plan logistics. I start to plan whether I need special access or not. Since this was a travel story and I'm going to very touristy places, I didn't want special access. I didn't require special access. And special access and permission has its pros and cons. So the pros of special access is often you get a unique perspective. Uh, and you get to see behind the scenes of certain things. The cons are they could say no, and also there's someone there following you around, and they probably show you things and want you to shoot things that they want you to shoot, and that's not always in line with what the story's about. So pros and cons with that kind of stuff. So this didn't require that. I figured visually I wanted to show people what it would be like to be on the cable car and experience the whole thing about riding cable cars in Vietnam as a tourist, so I figured I'd go as a tourist rather than go as a photographer, but put a lot of thought into these things. Then I start formulating ideas for visuals and what that might require. So for this, I was thinking, okay, I want shots on the cable car, I want shots from cable car to cable car, I want shots around the area, like long shots or even pulled back shots to see the cable car from afar. And then just sort of the tourism culture that goes into this, so people queuing up, people selling things, the destination they reach, things like that. So. 
once I have sort of the logistics plan out, how many days, what I'm trying to capture, then I might look at my gear set and sort of plan out what I want to shoot with. I have a variety of different types of gear for different types of shoots. For this assignment, I decided to take my Leica M10D, my trusty Leica 35 Summilux lens, and I thought I might need a long lens. I brought my old school Tele Elmar 135. And then since I'm considering a second camera for assignments and sometimes I need autofocus, I did ask Leica Vietnam if I could borrow the SL2S. I've been toying with this camera for a long time, whether to pull the trigger on it. So they were nice enough to loan me that. They also threw in a 24 to 90 millimeter lens. So I borrowed that camera, that lens. I had sort of two kits and I had the M adapter so I could put my M lenses on the SL2S as well. So that was my kit. Then I picked my bag out. I went with my Wotencraft backpack. I thought there might be a certain level of trekking to this, or at least I knew at the top of one of the cable cars, there's a little bit of a hike to the top of the mountain. So. The plan was to go to two different locations. One was in Katpa Island, about a two hour drive. The other was up in Sapa, about a four hour drive. Figured I'd go there and come back on the same day. So I went there for the day, got up at sunrise, got up before sunrise so I could get there before it opened. Shot a little bit around the lobby area, waiting for the place to open, see if I could find some little moments with people waiting for the cable car. Then rode the cable car. I wanted to give myself at both locations some options where I was on the cable car alone just so I could shoot from cable car to cable car. And then I wanted some options as well with you know a packed cable car. So that was kind of funny at the slow place because they were offering to let me go into like an empty one. And I was like, no, I'll just go with these people who probably didn't want me going in there, but I needed people in my shot. So went up there for the day, got a variety of shots, came back to Hanoi, backed up all my images. Then the next day I went up to Sapa. So I left as early as possible from Hanoi, got up there, spent a full day shooting. Again, riding the cable car with people, riding the cable car without people. And once I got to the top, looking for little moments, the weather was crap, it was misty that day, couldn't capture the views around it. So I decided to focus on the people and the destination. So where are they riding this cable car to? Well, it was the top of Fancy Pan Mountain, which is the highest peak in Indochina. It's a popular tourist destination. I saw this father and son wearing a national flag and they were climbing back down. So that was interesting. Just looking for little feature type shots in addition to my cable car shots. And so I got a nice variety there, even though the weather wasn't great. Uh, and just real quick, guys, just want to stop you for a minute. And just if you're liking this episode, please take a moment to like and subscribe. It does help the channels. And if you like, like me, if you want more exclusive content, more member perks and early release episodes, only $4.99 a month, consider joining the channel right now. Anyway, that's it. Back to the episode. So then on the last day before I was going to leave, I'm looking for some other feature shots. I like to incorporate some sort of street photography element or at least relevant street photography element into all my stories if I can pull it off. So shot cable cars as much as I could shoot cable cars. So I wandered downtown Sapa looking for anything that could relate to the story and it was great. So I'm up at sunrise wandering around and I see these giant signs advertising for the cable car to the top of Fancy Pan Mountain. I thought that was fantastic. All those signs were gigantic right in the city centers, but I didn't want just pictures of pictures and pictures of signs never really work out too well on their own. I wanted to elevate that shot, I wanted to bring people to Vietnam, so I just sat on it, I waited, took some shots that didn't really work, I waited, I waited, then finally this family of four just like drove by on their motorcycle and it was I was there to get the shot. And it worked out really well, and that ended up being, well, I won't tell you yet, but that ended up being one of my favorite images, and I'll show you which images the editor chose in the end as the lead image. And maybe you can formulate that idea so far after seeing some of the images that you've seen so far. So got that shot, was feeling good about myself, was happy, was done with the shooting element of this assignment. So headed back to Hanoi. Once I get back to Hanoi, it depends on the deadline. I either have to file right away or I can let it breathe for a minute. But one thing I do right away is back up my images. I used to do all this myself. Now I'm lucky enough to have an office administrator because we also do commercial work. Give her a hard drive of all the images. She backs everything up. I take the other hard drive. It takes me about a full work day to go through everything. So what I do is I take my large take. That might be for this shoot, maybe like a thousand images. I import those into Photo Mechanic. It's an old school photojournalist like sorting editing software that I just like. Yeah, I love it. A lot of a lot of photographers that do assignment photography like it. It's just quick and fast, snappy. Uh, so I call my images there, I tag them, I just label them a color, narrow it down once, maybe get that down to 300, then I take a second look, and I think about the story again, then I take it down to about 50 images from there. Okay, that's probably what I'm gonna file. I take those images, I send those over to Lightroom, I do basic color correction, nothing fancy. Then I export them and send them back to Photo Mechanic to do all the metadata, take my notes out, do the captioning, each publication you work for has different fields you need to fill in, a different way they like to name the files and fill in the metadata. New York Times is pretty straightforward, pretty easy. 
caption all the images, then I upload them to the server, then I send an email to the editor, let her know how many images I sent, and ask her if she has any questions. Sometimes it's follow-up questions, sometimes nothing. Sometimes the images get published like the next day or a couple days later, and sometimes it's months later. In this case, it was months later. And then once I file the images and the editor says that they got them, I file all my expenses, take my receipts out, uh, and file everything online. Again, different publications do things differently. The New York Times has a great automated system online. Fill out my expenses. Some of them, you just some of the publications just send an invoice. And then once the story is published, then I've still got work to do. <laughs> once the story is published, I will promote that story. So I'll promote the story itself. I'll share that link. I'll promote the images that I took on my Instagram. Again, I can't do any of this for embargo reasons until the story is published. I hope that's implied. I hope people know that. Like you don't share your images until it's been published. So then I promote, yeah, I promote on my Instagram. I might promote doing an episode like this. I might do a whole blog about it, sharing the images. And then I'll look through the images again and think like, is there anything in here that can make my portfolio? And I make a call there. For the story, nothing I don't think will make my actual portfolio, but you never know. I'm constantly like reassessing things, auditing my work and looking back and changing things around my website to keep it fresh. So as you can see, it's a lot of work. It's not just the two or three days of shooting. It ends up being more like seven days for two day assignment because you're planning for the travel days, obviously the shooting days, and then afterwards it's a full workday filing and then it's probably like a full workday promoting all this stuff. So it does add up, it is a lot of work. It is a lot of fun as well, it's exciting, it's fun to see your work published. It's fun to know, it's nice to know that it's like there forever on the New York Times website. Uh, it exists there, it lives there, and people see it from all around the world. So that's why I do it, that's why I like doing these kind of assignments. That's what it's like to do a New York Times travel assignment from start to finish. I know this was long, but I just kind of wanted to give you guys, some people are interested in like everything and how it works. Hope you guys enjoyed this episode. If you have any questions on what it's like to do an assignment or anything specifically about this assignment or specifically about the images, ask me in the comment section. I do my best to answer every single question you guys ask. So go ahead, let's start a dialogue in there. Hope you guys enjoyed this episode. Again, don't forget to check out my online store. I've got that great sale right now in my monthly mentorship program, but I've also got other classes on there and I've got presets and I've got prints available heading into holiday season that are great as gifts. So take a moment, check out my online store at justinmott.com. Again, if you like this channel and you want exclusive content, bonus content, early release content, consider joining for $4.99 a month. It does also help my channel as well. Helps me create more content like this. Thank you guys for tuning in. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, and don't forget to have a wonderful day.